Good morning, everyone. Um, probably uh, this uh, uh, talk should be better called RPC to Hypermedia. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, there are going to be a, a great uh, deal of uh, speakers today uh, touching on that. Um, I'm here today actually to pitch against uh, Winston Churchill, who said uh, to jaw jaw is better to war war. Um, I'm going to say exactly the same, so, or exactly the opposite. So how do you go to war uh, in today's uh, era? You go to war with guns, with tools. Um, so um, who am I matters less. I'm going to pitch for an idea and you can tag along. Um, OK, in this room, probably more or less everyone knows what RPC is. It's just making a remote procedure call. Don't trust the code. This is just an example. What is REST? Well, in uh, Vox Populi, by popular vote, uh, you would say that uh, it's just making a HTTP request. And it looks like this. If it wasn't for the animation, do you see any difference? Well, <coughs> probably not. Um, and it's really, really hard to, to, to pitch for REST or hypermedia you know, in, in when, when you don't really see the difference. I mean. In terms of coupling, uh, what, what changed? Most probably you go from like 102 uh, RPC methods uh, to 102 um, APIs, right? Um, I don't really see the gain there, but many people actually do see a gain there. They think it's less ugly, uh, more beautiful, less smelly, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't buy those arguments. What changes in terms of uh, API libraries? Uh, you, you probably assume the, the, the answer to this. You just start building uh, new libraries. They have maybe a different interface. At the end of the day, they are more or less the same. They are proprietary uh, pieces of software uh, that, like yesterday, we have seen lots of speakers say it. They will be deprecated and, uh, yeah then you'll have to reinvent something else. All right. This is intentionally white, or almost white. Um, this is a snapshot of uh, documentation of a REST API. It's a well-known um, file, uh, file sharing, or I don't know how to call it, uh, um, uh, service. Um, and I, I, th this is one of the slimmest ones. Uh, if you go to, uh, to somebody else, you'll probably see, this is 18 pages, by the way. If you go to another service, you'll probably discover 25, maybe even more pages of documentation. What does this service do? It hosts files and gives me access. So I have to waste like half an hour to read all of this in order to learn in 2012 how to work with files and folders and permissions and operations on files. Maybe that's not what I want to do. And it's not just one. Um, it's more or less everyone. I mean, it's a trendy thing to, to go rest-wise. Everybody wants to do it. It thinks it's uh, really the, the thing to do today. Um, I'm not blaming anyone. I mean, I, I think it's very easy to understand um, some of the common REST or, I don't know, REST as it is today. So I think it's very, very clear to, you know, go for it. Just as uh, maybe 10, 20 years ago it was clear to do RPC. Yeah, it's, it's a function that you call remotely, it gives you a re uh, reply back, perfect. And it also has a very uh, trustworthy trend. Um, in, um, in Violet there, that is a REST API in Google Trends. I have no reason to believe that that will go down anytime soon. Uh, the same goes for uh, another snapshot of uh, programma programmable uh, web. It just, APIs are exploding. That's good, but you might end up uh, having uh, like manuscripts uh, of uh, a ton just to know what they do and how to interact with them. Um, in yellow, you have the term hypermedia in 
um, Google Trends. And I leave you with that. Hypermedia API is like nowhere on the map. Um, and you take that as you want, but f for me, um, that makes a, a very great um, impediment to actually um, teach someone, may it be another colleague, developer, or may it be a business guy to actually uh, approve of uh, hypermedia API. So for me personally, I stick with REST. Let's back up a bit. I'm coming from uh, Klarna. It's a, uh, it's a company in uh, Sweden. Uh, we're offering payment solutions for seven years now to seven European countries, and we're basically booming. Um, the new kid on the block is uh, a Klarna Checkout. It's, I'm not going to pitch for it. You can go to the Klarna.com uh, Swedish website and, and see, uh, see a video there. Um, but it's basically a, an intelligent uh, checkout that uh, removes friction. What we have today as an API is basically our integration point would be a, a number of uh, API libraries. Uh, behind those, there is an XML RPC. And, you know, we, we have now like approximately 30 um, RPC uh, methods described, the most important ones. I think uh, they, they came down from like 100, but several other payment solutions, for instance, they still have over 100. Um, I like to, to, uh, um, to tag XML RPC most of the times with um, we know what you want. If we don't know it, then you don't want it. Because that's the bottom line. You just define a, a linear narrative, and you insert some snapshots, and you say, yes, you have to call us now, send us this data, we'll send you back this data. Uh, and this, you, know, you look around at the environment, and you would expect people to understand that this is not a viable solution. We scale like, like crazy, and we need to think you know, five years um, from now. Uh, Documentation-wise, it doesn't scale. Uh, coupling with, between co client and server doesn't scale. Um, building uh, API libraries does not scale. Why? Because even right now, we have lots of API libraries that are um, very, very old. We cannot do anything about that. Once the client is happy with the product, it stays there. It can be five years, 10 years old. You have to uh, make use of that. And because maybe when you're extremely huge, you're OK with deprecation. In, in, a, in the business world, probably you, you, you have to you know, uh, be there for 30 years in order to, to hear a business guy, yes, it's OK to, to lose 10 uh, customers. Um, so anyway, you, you would say that it's very, very easy to see that this does not scale. In turn, it's not really like that. You have to like explain lots of things to maybe uh, more or less technically versed people. At the end, you know, it's a long track. You lose them. So, take Clarna Checkout for instance. We started. Uh, we, we had some minimal uh, documentation. It looked uh, restish as far as uh, most of the people uh, knew at that time. It was a JSON RPC. Not even there, but many people were calling it the REST API. Everybody was happy. Uh, I think six months into the project, there was lots of coupling. How many functions do you think we had? Four. Um, and then you, you get this business perspective where things ha have, um, have to happen in a natural way. Uh, at some point, the client, the, the merchant in this case, needs to receive or send some data. Why is that not possible? Well, we have some requirements on what fields you need to send in, and we can only send uh, a number of other fields back. So we have to create another function because it's linearly dependent. Uh, so it, it really doesn't go. Um, by luck, I would say, we, we went in, into some uh, REST form. And today, uh, uh, Clarna Checkout has a REST API. Uh, it's, it's public beta, but it's debatable as, as if, uh, in terms of hypermedia. Um, but it, it's good anyway that 
we're on the on the track there. All right. So if it's really really hard to uh, to uh, envision this, then let's take a step back and see a possible journey of the API. This is a, a my simplification of things. You don't have to agree with it. Just take it as a possible uh, scenario. So no matter if you have a transition of, a, of an API from a style to a style, or if you uh, design your API from, from the start right now, you probably have a, have a vision of it. You envision it. And then maybe you should spec it, and then mock it, both for client and server uh, developers, in order to interact with it as, as, and see flaws and comment on it. Uh, serve it, and then consume it. In today's world, most people actually focus, I would say, sorry if I'm making uh, weird assumptions, on serving it. Um, it's a misconception, I would say, but you know, um, envisioning an API is, yeah, we just dream about it, we draw a couple of things on the whiteboard, make sense, yes, uh, then we, we spec it, meaning uh, we, we just write some HTTP calls and so on, it makes sense as well. You then mock it. Most of the times, as, as far as I've seen, mock it uh, means implement partially. Then you implement to the full extent, and then, well, we're the, just the server guy, so somebody else has to build some API libraries to consume it. Perfect story. Maybe not. But um, take, for instance, just HTTP. It's a really, really complex thing. You would say that there are just a handful of methods that you usually call. Uh, and then uh, you have some um, uh, headers. The combinations of those are not so nice. Then you have some status codes. All in all, you have to tackle all of that in a uniform way. Some libraries do it. This is a, an example of um, liberator in, in Clojure. And I guess this is more familiar to some of you. This is a, a diagram in Web Machine. Web Machine basically um, uh, uh, takes care of the flow of requests and then just allows you to, uh, uh, to have callbacks in order to decide whether uh, some question is true or false or what are the possible uh, scenarios there. In the end, you don't really need to understand HTTP. You don't really need to care about the uniform uh, response because Web Machine takes care of that. We were lucky. Our, our code base is driven by Erlang, so it, it was a natural choice to go with this. Like yesterday, you have seen most people choose what, whatever uh, software uh, they have in-house skills for. That's not the best approach, but this is how it goes. Um, luckily, I think we made the right choice no matter our in-house skill. What do you do next? Well, some people agree, some people don't agree. In a business environment, you have to be really strict about what terms mean and how you use them. Uh, that, in turn, comes down to some sort of uh, validation schema in order to see that you send the right data and you receive the right data, both from a client and server perspective. Um, because we decided for, for JSON, uh, we went with the JSON schema. Uh, there was no Erlang. Uh, a library for that. So in turn, we had to develop it and we called it Jesse, Jason Erlang uh, Schema. Um, what do you do next? Well, as far as I can see or I can assume from what I see online, people just stop there, then they build, uh, they, they have another team, write documentation, it doesn't matter how long it is, then they hire some consultants in order to and uh, make it more uh, uh, readable for whoever goes there. You make it more simple in the beginning, uh, more complete uh, as you go through it. Um, you, can, you can see complexity like this. I, I, I saw it at, uh, at a talk, uh, at a conference in, in Stockholm. Um, if you take complexity in, in this, this triangle, and then you have the intuitive uh, line there moving up and down. What, whatever is left of the triangle in the upper part, that's what the user has to deal with. Whatever is down, it, that's the developer. That's the developer trying to achieve that, to cover all that complexity 
in a way that the user is not uh, aware of. If you take web machine, for instance, and even JSON schema, um, that line is, is pretty high. I, I don't have to know HTTP at all. I just know that I have to implement some callbacks. And there you go. I implemented a, a resource as uniformly as possible. I move on. Um, otherwise, you, you will need to uh, duplicate lots of code. I actually don't know how people do it uh, nowadays, because in order to like, throw out co uh, status codes uh, in a uniform way, I question the uniform way. Um, so how do you do that? Well, uh, I ended up thinking exactly the other way around. Because at some point, you have the light bulb. You, know, you read about uh, hypermedia. And it's not really easy to read about that. REST is you know, double, double meaning, double, uh, a double blade. Uh, so you never know what is actually REST, what is not REST. Then you read lots of HTTP specs. Yeah, at some point, you just get the light bulb. Um, so OK, the whole idea is to decouple client and server. Correct. The whole idea is to make it as easy as possible for the client to, to interact with your API. Correct. The whole idea is to uh, document as little as possible because there is no more um, hard coupling between client and server. Correct. So take it 180 degrees between uh, you, you know, the, the previous slide, where you would focus on how you serve the API, take it on the other uh, four steps there. How do you actually envision it? How do you spec it? How do you mock it? And what is your uh, API client going to look like? I went blank when I uh, thought about envisioning it. Uh, there, there is no tool out there to envision a, a, a hypermedia API on a very minimal level. But that, at, at the minimal level, you just have some resources and some relationships. This is a, a, a crappy prototype, but at least it, it gets the message through on, onto the other side. Basically, it's just the, the resources and the relationship between them. That is another try at, at doing it in a similar way. Um, you would be astonished to, to see how uh, less uh, technical uh, people uh, ap approach this. I mean, OK, this makes sense. I have an order, and it's connected to some shipping address, to, an, uh, to a customer, to a cart. Makes perfect sense. If this is your documentation, and if that's all you need, then that's perfect with the business guys. But we had to do it in-house, and it's not exactly what I envision as a developer. Then meet uh, RESTPy. Uh, RESTPy is basically the, the hub of all, 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 all our documentation. What it does, it, it builds on JSON schema uh, to, to define uh, the, the custom media, uh, media types, uh, to define the um, relations. And there is a missing chain there, and that is the operations. And what we achieve with that is actually um, a hypermedia documentation, because I can actually jump from one of these types of nodes to the other. I can uh, um, jump from a resource to, an op to, to a link, to a relationship, and the relationship exposes maybe some operations. I click on an operation, then it exposes a, a resource or uh, a media type. There's another thing that RESTPy does, um, and that is um, making it a, an easy platform for documentations for humans, because then at the end of the day, you'll have to defend why you have chosen this path with, you know, why, why custom media media types, why, why patch over po post or put, or a, a, a different tons of things. The, the whole journey also makes you read a, a whole great of deal, which at the end of the day, you don't know what to make of it. But you have to document that in a way, because somebody else might actually understand what those articles are about. But th it, it's in that spirit that this documentation is, is, is done. Um, the quote there is like, uh, when, when, um, um, when uh, human documentation uh, human documentation is 
what, what you do when nothing else works. There's another thing, uh, the, the mock-up step. I think APR is a, is a great placement there. I, I personally don't, don't have to do anything about the mocking uh, part. Thank you, APR. Uh, one thing that REST, uh, RESTPy does, Pi, by the way, I forgot to mention, is, is a crappy name for REST programma programmable interface or programming interface. What RESTPy does, because I have all those JSON schemas that define uh, relationships, uh, resources, media types, operations, I can bundle that all together and make a blueprint for uh, apiary. I, I have uh, written only one request by, by hand, and that was when I tried out apiary. The rest are automatically generated. I don't know how others do it. Uh, Consuming it, uh, it's a small prototype of a hypermedia client. Funny enough, there are very few hypermedia clients. Um, I think there are three that I know of, REST agent, uh, Hector, and I think there's another one. I forgot its name. Um, why, why did I approach this path? Because um, you have to show again, to the, business uh, to the business side and to the uh, uh, developers, the ones that are actually going to produce an API library, how this works. You also have to show to the uh, in-house developers, the, the ones on the server side, how this is supposed to be consumed. And you, you have no idea how. Um, of course, it's, it's good if there were 100 uh, hypermedia clients. But bottom line is that would just uh, be creating artifacts and not necessarily contributing out there because there is actually no principle, no, no guideline to follow or agree with. So I came up with, with these ones. Take them as they are. Um, we can talk about that later. Uh, I'll take a more complicated example uh, just because we're running out of time. Um, you know, you start from uh, a URI, you go read, you follow maybe a link, you then create something, you follow a location, you can debate the, the, the uniform interface there. But what this does is, again, makes it very easy to uh, make a case for a hypermedia API because everybody understands this. I don't have to go on for a week, a month, in order to explain what the hypermedia API is and why is this so simple? So, bottom line to conclude, uh, tools, simpler, safer, and more fun. That's Klarna's tagline, and I think it makes a very good uh, sense also for uh, how you would want to develop uh, APIs as well. Um, talk less, code more, debate principles, and then move to war. So, keep it to tools. It's... Uh, and a, a way to paraphrase, keep it simple, stupid. Let's have less of these conferences where we can, uh, you know, debate tools rather than uh, how to do it and how not to do it and so on and so forth. It's very easy to, to look at an artifact and say, yes, this is actually a, a plus for the whole process rather than debate uh, an idea that may or may not be applicable to me and so on. Thank you.